You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, we're in Sheffield. Hello, I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freib. Hi, Richard. Lionel Richie. Oh, wonderful. That, that trails nicely, uh, an interview that we've got coming up uh, on the podcast soon with Dave Brailsford. Just as we started the interview, Hello by Lionel Richie began playing. It was, it was a wonderful moment. Lionel and I did pretty well to stifle our giggles, I think, when that happened. We should point out we weren't at a Lionel Richie gig. We were just in a hotel bar sure area. It was mood surely, surely Brailsford, as a regular listener of the podcast, got the joke. He did. Definitely. He was, he was laughing inside. Lionel, where are we? We are in the Motor Point Arena in Sheffield. It's been our press room this afternoon for the second stage of the Tour de France from York to Sheffield. It's uh, it's a basically a, a big hangar where you'd come and watch, um, I don't know, Beyonce or somebody. <laughs> exactly. OK, let's cut out this nonsense and talk about a thrilling stage. It was a thrilling stage. Uh, stage one had a, a very exciting finale, but there was lots of intrigue uh, throughout today's stage, really. Nine classified climbs... And it all came down to the final climb, the Cote de Jenkin Road, also known as Jenkin Road, <laughs> um, locally. Um, and it was a really steep climb, just five kilometres or so from the finish. And we saw all the big guns come forward there. Alberto Contador was one of the first to move forward. He was shadowed by Chris Froome, Peter Sagan, Vincenzo Nibali was there looking good as well. And it was a really exciting finish. Contador didn't really have an attack. He just he just sat there. I thought maybe seeing what Chris Froome had, Contador was isolated at this point as well. He didn't seem to have any teammates around him. Froome took the bait and had a little go over the over the top of the climb. Dave Brilsford insisted afterwards that it was not an attack. He was quite insistent about that. It looked like an attack to me. He jumped um, just before the brow of the hill. He was brought back, as you would expect, Pierre Roland was active, he was away for a while as well, but in the end Vincenzo Nibali clipped away and held off for a really brilliant stage win, Daniel. Yeah, Froome's non-attack was a non-attack in the same way his attack was at La Tussuire in 2012, correct? Or his non-attack on stage two in the Tour de France last year in Corsica, he did a, a non-attack there as well. But the, the thing is that Froome, I think Brailsford would like to think that Froome was following the plan, which was probably to, to be con- quite conservative at this stage of the race, to not certainly not go for a stage win, because that, that was the last thing they really wanted. They were very happy that Nibali won the stage in the yellow jersey. The pos- overall position is very important at this time for the um, placing of the cars, and a lot of people have been talking about this ahead of Wednesday's stage over the cobbles, stage five, the positioning of the cars is so, so important, and Froome mentioned that that's why he was up there at the front on stage one in the sixth place and a high overall position is very very important but they didn't want first and so they're very happy that Nibali has taken the yellow jersey yeah I should just kind of add to that the uh, when Richard says the position of the cars uh, what you mean there is uh, the team cars that follow the peloton I mean, what I mean Lionel is the position of the cars well yeah I know but for some listeners who perhaps don't know that they're behind the bunch is a whole stream of all the team cars in order of general classification yeah. on the team's classification though isn't it or is it is it these days on no, the overall individual for individual riders so it's on individual riders so the yellow jerseys um, team car will be the first team car in the um, uh, in the convoy and of course if you're 15th or 20th team car um, then you're a long way behind the back of the bunch so if there's punctures or mechanical problems um, then it's going to take a lot longer to get up to service the riders. And at the um, Astana bus this evening, they're almost as happy about um, the first place that they've got now in the race convoy behind the bunch as they were about the yellow jersey. You know, they were 17th in the race convoy um, starting today's stage. And um, Vincenzo Nibali's coach, Paolo Slongo, really emphasised how important that was ahead of the, the Pave stage. I mean, just generally, um, obviously, a really sort of festive mood um, around the Astana bus this evening, um, Vino was there. Alexander Vinokurov, not a friend of the podcast, not yet, um, with his with his a kind of um, sort of inverted Kangol cap that he was wearing, um, and of course Vinokurov was said to have um, reputed to have, have, have sort of given given Vincenzo Nibali a bit of a sort of brow beating um, in a letter in the spring, told him to he needed to up his game. 
Um, he needed to perform slightly better. I asked Vinokur about that today. He said no, it wasn't a, a letter directed to at Nibali. It was a, a letter to the whole team, um, and he sort of smiled and said, "Well, it seemed to have the desired effect, didn't it?" Um, and and you know, Vinci, um, Nibali's victory today. I mean, it's very very difficult to go away from a a group and um, with two kilometres to go. But I just thought that you know we talked yesterday about how confident Kittel is at the moment and how um, he, he's kind of decisions or his, his mind almost seems to be working in slow motion he can take um, sort of very clinical decisions um, because he's so confident and I, I think today was symptomatic of Nibali's confidence having really grown since he won the Italian National Championship last week and he just chose the perfect moment to go away Nukarov uh, will be writing him a love letter this evening uh, incidentally uh, Lionel and I spoke to the Stana press officer at the, the Giro and uh, he let slip the revelation that Vinokurov writes poetry. He writes poetry, and uh, talking, he'll be talking composed. Talking poetry. Talking of poetry. Here's a man who's much in demand and very busy tonight. Chiro, our friend Chiro, a very, very big day for you. A big day for you. Yes, I'm very busy, but I always find a little bit of time for our listeners, for you. It's a duty for me. Chiro, you were recognised today in the Village de Par, weren't you, by a podcast listener? Uh, well, I can't confirm this um, this quote from you, Richard. I don't want uh, <laughs> to confirm. I misquoted exactly. you. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true, and uh, I'm happy because uh, that means that uh, the cycling podcast by Telegraph. I say, well, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's really increasing. I mean, it's becoming bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and so I'm happy. It certainly is, but we have got a bit of a bone to pick with you, Chiro, because you were saying that Nibali's not in tour-winning form and then he goes and launches an attack like that, wins a stage in the yellow jersey. You, do you really know what you're talking about? Dear Lionel, the problem is that I certainly don't have a crystal ball. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be here with you and with my friends talking about the Tour de France but on a lovely beach to pass my free time. No, but uh, as a matter of fact, I'm a little bit surprised by this victory, I must confess. And, uh, and this means that uh, yeah, I don't want to say that from today Nibali... Uh, can become a really contender for the victory of the Tour de France. For the moment, I still convinced that uh, the other two big contenders are stronger. But yes, uh, starting from today, maybe he can really start uh, to dream uh, to have a concrete possibility to win the yellow jersey in Paris. But it's it's a very long way. Did you speak to him after the stage, uh, Chiro? What did he say? Yeah, a lot. Uh, he he told us that the attack uh, was. Uh, uh, a little bit studied and a little bit not studied, you know. Fulgang was the first to move with four Ks to go, and then he spoke to Michele Scarponi, and uh, it, he, he was, in my opinion, and he said that uh, I it was really good to have a really uh, to find the real time to do this attack at the very right moment and um, have you noticed uh, when he won he indicated the Italian jersey we spoke also about this uh, in the podcast in the yesterday podcast and so it's also a kind of revenge uh, for him after these polemics and we have also to say uh, that with the yellow jersey nobody will see the Italian flag now I was just going to say, uh, I don't know what you guys felt, but um, I thought that the race from kind of Jenkin Road to the finish, it was almost like the last half lap of a World Championship road race, and Nibali's attack was one of those. It was obviously a searing attack, but it was a real kind of slider. He got the gap, and then he kind of maintained the gap, and then he just kept the, the pressure on. And, and behind, no one wanted to burn their last match. Um, Sky didn't want to um, put any, any work in to, um, to close the gap because they didn't really need to. Things would work out perfectly for them um, overall. Uh, Peter Sagan didn't do anything because he was by then isolated and somebody asked him at the finish why he didn't um, chase down Nibali and he said, well, one of the reasons was because he's an old teammate of Nibali and he said, he's my friend and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to just tow everybody else up when I don't have the legs to win the sprint. So it was a real cagey kind of non-reaction behind Nibali, but take nothing away from him because it was, it was a perfectly timed attack. Do you buy that from Sagan? I mean, my reading of it was that um, he made the classic mistake of someone who is too strong and this is also what Paolo Slongo, who is um, 
Vincenzo Nibali's coach now, used to be Peter Sagan's coach, said to me at the finish line, he said last year he was constantly telling Sagan when he was strong not to show his cards like he did today. You know, he, he was with the leaders over Jenkin Road. He attacked on the way down. It was very, very obvious that he was really strong. He probably should have kept something in reserve. Yeah, but his teammates demonstrated that he was really, really strong by doing all of that work earlier on and, and really sort of, they couldn't have done more if they'd lit a flare to say Peter Sagan looks and feels great. Uh, I should uh, say, just break up this argument and say that I spoke to Jakob Fuglsang at the end of the stage, a teammate of Vincenzo Nibali in Astana, and he s- said that the, there was an instruction coming over the radio to attack, but he wasn't quite sure who it was aimed at. It was all uh, We've spoken before about the, the difficulties, this perception that races are decided by directors, sportifs and team cars ordering the riders to move at certain times. He couldn't really understand uh, what was being said, but he did hear the word attack. So he, as uh, as Chiro mentioned, he, he launched the first attack. I spoke to him after the stage, and he told us a little bit about his surprise at Nibali winning it and what the team's plans are now. They have the yellow jersey. No, actually not. The, 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 the whole idea was on, the, on, the, on Jenkins Road to try to put a hard pace that in the end it was not us who, who did the pace there, and then to, to try to get get a better position for the car and in the cottage behind because they were car number 17 and, and looking looking towards the, the cobblestone stages it would be nice to have it uh, further in front and in the end uh, on the meeting we were talking about that, that me and, and Vincenzo we shouldn't move but uh, <laughs> but the other guys should should try if, if, if there was still somebody left <laughs> but were you, were you surprised when Vincenzo attacked that he got the gap that he got yeah and he, he came with a, with a good attack and with good speed from behind but uh, was well, still a little bit surprised that that, that they let him oh, that he went so so relatively easy and uh, was in the end only only Jürgen van der Broek who, who tried to to close it down and uh, tried to put myself in between to take the pace a little bit out of the chase uh, once he, we, he stopped pulling and Vincenzo obviously has overall ambitions here how does it feel uh, to have the yellow jersey so early in the race is this a good thing or a, or a, or a bad thing to begin with, it's a, it's it's a good thing. But uh, last year in the Welter, we had the, <laughs> the red jersey from from day one, only only given away one or two days, uh, all the way to to the second last day, and and Vincenzo finished second. Hope that that won't won't happen here, and uh, yeah, we see. But but for now, we have to enjoy it. He'll take a huge confidence boost from this, I imagine. It's it's always nice to win a stage of the Tour de France, isn't it? For sure, for sure. It's huge for him also, and uh, it's his first stage win at uh, the Tour also, and then two. What have you made of the two days in Yorkshire? It's crowded here. <laughs> <laughs> too many people. Yeah, in the end, yeah. For for bike race, yes. Ah, oh, it's been wonderful and. Uh, amazing crowds but uh, it becomes dangerous now and then The Telegraph Cycling Podcast supported by Jaguar with Richard Moore, Lionel Bernie and Daniel Freib So you're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast supported by Jaguar you can uh, subscribe to us on iTunes as well as listening to us on, on Audioboo and, and the Telegraph's own website. I'm still here Richard Moore with Daniel Freib, Lionel Bernie and Chiro Scognomilio, our friend our good friend. We're going to carry on talking a little bit about uh, Sunday's thrilling stage and then in the final part we'll reflect on the departure from the tour of Mark Cavendish who sadly wasn't able to start stage 2 after his crash on stage 1. Chiro I think you had something to add to the analysis of uh, Sunday's stage about Sunday's stage I mean that's uh, today Chiro yeah 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 I mean you know I'm a little bit confused because for me this year yes exactly we are still in the Tour de France yes it's difficult for me to realize no I can anticipate for our listener one thing that I will write on the (laughs) Gazzetta edition tomorrow about Paolo Slongo Daniel mentioned it is the coach of Vincenzo Nibali but in this tour he has also a special role in the team in every stage he anticipates the bunch in a certain way he see the parkour all the all the streets all the virage all the, the, this kind of thing if there are some tricky parties and in, in a certain way and he communicates with SMS and in real time uh, things these things to the team so in a certain way, it's kind of a second eye of Vincenzo Nibali on the race. I will write this on Gazette, but 
for our listeners. For me, it's a pleasure to anticipate this to them. So this is, is this a case then, Daniel? Chiro's gone, he's gone to find, he's running. Hey, be fair, he's got a very, very busy day. You know, yellow jersey for an Italian for the first time since uh, Nocentini, was it? 2008 or 9, whenever that was. Um, Anyway, um, I was picking up on what Chiro said there. That's nothing kind of new to us. Sky, BMC, and uh, and 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 um, HTC Columbia, and a lot of other teams have done this, where they've sent somebody ahead of the course to phone back and say, you know, there's road furniture or a tight roundabout or a or a tight corner. But it's interesting that our Italian friend here, um, for a team like Astana, perhaps more old school, are they just kind of picking up on this kind of thing? Do you know, Daniel? Uh, well, yeah, and uh, I mean, I was surprised by. Chiro being surprised by that in a way um, and, and Slongo um, you know I spoke to him at the finish today and asked him about Nibali's form compared to Froome's form and Contador's form and he said well if I was coaching them I'd be worried now because they've been in form for so long you know they were so much better than Vincenzo at the at the Dauphine but again you know that seems to sort of be old school thing. this is kind of old school received knowledge that you can't be good at the Dauphine and at the Tour de France um, you know, Slongo's credentials are pretty good. He's fairly highly thought of in Italian cycling. But, and you know, just today as well brought into focus how far behind some of the teams are in terms of course knowledge. And a lot of the teams hadn't recorded these first two stages. You know, I made the point on Twitter that it seems bizarre to me that teams will go year after year to um, recay climbs like the Galibier, the, the Tourmalet, which most of us know. You know, most of us have ridden them at some point, um, and they go in April or May when the riders aren't necessarily in the same form. They're going to be in at, at the Tour. They're not using the same gears. Um, yet they completely neglect stages like today's, which um, could easily have cost someone the Tour de France. And I mentioned that Contador was isolated at the end. Fulasang also spoke a bit about that. It wasn't in the interview with him, but he said that he has thinking on it was that perhaps they had underestimated just how hard that finale was and we know of course that Condor didn't recce that stage I mean the word from Tinkov Saxo and I don't know whether this was sort of some kind of clever kind of historical revisionism but Bjarne Reese or the team management said that their intention was always to rest about half the team in the last 30 kilometres they decided that there were going to be no significant gaps between the overall contenders if that is the case, it, it could prove to be a very, very clever strategy. You know, Contador came through the stage unscathed. Um, it, it's a very novel strategy. It's the kind of thing that Bjarne Reese has done in the past and it's very a, interesting. It's a curious decision to make having not seen the, the, the course, not seen the stage. Yeah, I agree. I and, and, you know, as you say, Reese is famed for his, his uh, the, the sort of detailed preparation. Um, it, I think it is a surprising oversight and you know, Reese has gone from being the man in charge of the team to to DS. It's almost a demotion, and you just wonder how engaged he is in in that role, and whether he's as um, as committed as as consumed by the job as as he was when you know in the glory days of CSC and Saxo Bank when it was his baby. On the flip side, though, they did get away with it. I mean, none of the main um, favourites for the tour lost any time or any significant time. Uh, Garmin Sharp did do a lot of work to try and whittle that group down but then there wasn't really anyone else who was going to uh, put quite the same um, effort into it it was Tom Yelta Slagter um, and uh, with Andrew Talansky on his wheel um, I should also <coughs> point out of course Marcel Kittle the yellow jersey where uh, lost that um, he got distance on Hull Moss the second category climb probably not a surprise a lot of people lost contact there and they kind of just just rode in he wasn't going to um, get back into contact from there but it was exciting. It was uh, certainly the finale was was I thought was edge of the seat stuff. Nibali's attack really you could you could have imagined that in a world stuff. championship um, final, as I said earlier. Um, but it didn't do the damage that perhaps some of the teams were fearing it might do, or perhaps that we were anticipating it might. Having said that, they've now got that day in their legs. Uh, it did look hard at times, and um, although there wasn't perhaps the out-and-out warfare because it's only the second day of the tour, that, that stage will certainly make itself known in the, in the coming week or so. No, it's as you were uh, in terms of the overall contenders, pretty much all the team leaders were up there. Andy Schleck, if he's still a, a big name, I'm not sure. He lost one minute 19, but everybody else is, is sort of within seconds of each other. Rui Costa, people like that. TJ Van Garderen was very aggressive uh, and looked good. And, you know, there's a big question mark about him. Roman Bardet was up there as well, a young rider t- to look out for. But 
Uh, Daniel, I think you spoke to Max Chandry, um, TJ Van Garderen's director of sport at BMC. I did, Rich, um, and I was I was curious about TJ's kind of return to form today. He looked very poor in the Dauphiné just a few weeks ago, um, and I put it to Max Chandry that it was a very positive day, in spite of the fact that um, that one of their big hopes for the stage, Greg Van Avermaet, had not managed to bring home the victory. Um, nonetheless, both he and Van Garderen had performed very, very well. This is uh, good morale for us, you know, good morale for Greg, good morale for TJ. TJ is looking for little confirmations and he was up there when uh, Froomey went. Greg, really good. He hesitated on the first time when uh, Nibali went. That could have been a good one. Then he still managed to finish second in the sprint up there, so now he's up there in GC. So we're, we're looking good. No, I, no, no injuries, no crashes, no major stuff. So, you know, for us, it's coming out this first week unharmed, everybody in there. And uh, that's what's happening. Um, there were a few concerns about TJ's form a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, today he seemed extremely strong. Was as he pretty much followed the kind of schedule that you expected in terms of coming into form just at the right time? Well, you know, he had a few ups and downs uh, in Paris Nice. He was sick. He's out. Then he kind of raced on the Spanish races. Came to Rome and he crashed on the prologue. Had a small uh, pelvis fracture. That slowed him down again you know but we just we just kept him on track just keeping focused you know good morale we believe in him always even on the bad days when he came into Dolphin Air and he took a little bit of a, of a downside the first couple stages we just said let's just look forward let's just look at the last week in the in the tour and and that's where we're going to start to be really good you know as I said come out this first week and harm and then move forward. Okay. Last thing, Max, um, there were a lot of concerns yesterday from the riders about safety, um, people were perhaps encroaching too far onto the road. Any better today? No, it's good that they buried it off the last couple of climbs. Uh, the people, I mean, the people are amazing. Um, I don't think the, the, the whole authorities were expecting so much people, so many people, and, and, and maybe people don't understand the speed the riders go through and the cars and... And uh, you, uh, you see people crossing in the last moments. Nothing happened dangerous, but it's very dangerous. You know, I, I think in the future there should be a little bit more awareness of... of th this is professional cycling. It's professional cycling, the speed is so much different. Anything, everything is elevated to the, to the maximum, you know, so... But it's great. You're listening to The Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Patrick, Mark Cavendish came to the start this morning in York on the team bus. Was there any chance whatsoever of him starting or was he just coming to talk to no, the press? No, he wanted to, to explain to the press personally how he feels and uh, what happened and uh, uh, why he couldn't start and I think uh, it's a good, good thing to do. Uh, uh, of course, we're very sad he can't start anymore but it's life. What did you think of the crash? Because he took responsibility for it yesterday. Yeah. I saw several times the, the video. He was so focused. He was in his head. He has a point where he wanted to start his sprint. Unfortunately for him, uh, Gerens came on the left side, was falling a little bit, uh, losing a little bit speed. So a rider who loses speed, what he does, he, he looks for a slipstream, and the slipstream was not on the left side but on the right side. And this, this was the place where Mark Cavendish was. So you will see on the sprint a little bit the yellow bow of Garans to, to, to make him the place. And Mark wanted to get out. And he, they're both extra riders. They're, they're, they're uh, growing up without brakes. Yesterday you, um, you said that nothing was broken. We later found out that he has a separated shoulder. So technically nothing is broken. But was that you having wishful thinking that he would be okay no, to start? No, because our, our doctor is... Uh, Orthopedic chair. So the the first examinations on the, on the bus was no cobble, no uh, no shoulder broken, no cobble bone broken. But of course he knew about the ligaments. There was also the reason why we went to the hospital. And how does this change things now for your team? Because guys like Mark Renshaw and Alessandro Pataki, their purpose in the race has kind of gone home. And what will their roles be now? We are uh, obligated to change tactics. We, we're like a soccer team who has to go from defensive to offensive. So does that mean trying to maybe target the white jersey and a high place overall? 
Well, everything uh, who comes on the road that we can take, uh, we, we will try to do it. We were uh, winning this year 42 races with 30 different riders. So uh, we tried to select the nine best riders of the team and uh, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't have own ambitions. Well, Mark was here, so uh, if Mark is gone, I don't know how say it in English, but in Flemish you said, the dead of one is the bread of another. And lastly, just a word on Pataki, because he finished a long way down yesterday. What was the problem with him, and is he OK today? He was uh, hit by a bee okay. two days ago, and he had an allergic reaction. But as you know, in, in cycling, you cannot uh, have a medical treatment uh, necessary because of the medical uh, controls. So where was he stung by the bee? On the, on the, on the head, on the head, yes. Okay. But he's OK? I hope so. He was very bad yesterday uh, in his head, and then, uh, unfortunately, the crowd... Uh, avoid him to, to finishing in a normal way so the sports director was filming with the iPhone uh, that he couldn't write and to prove to the, to the jury and they, they took him uh, in the race again So he was so far down that the crowd was all covering the road and he yeah. couldn't get through yeah. The last three kilometers he couldn't ride anymore wow. The crowds were amazing yesterday, obviously you come from Belgium, huge culture of cycling there, we see huge crowds at the Tour of Flanders but what was yesterday like for you? Well it's my 32 Tour de France and I never saw this again I was here in '94. It was already amazing. I was here in London. Uh, huge number of public, but this this beating everything. So the second voice we heard there was that of Patrick Lefebvre, the very deep voiced baritone, Omega Pharma Quick Step uh, overall team boss, Mark Cavendish's team, obviously. We'll try and get him on the podcast as much as possible, only because he's got a really good voice for radio. But Lionel, you spoke to him a little bit, and we're going to talk a bit now about the uh, sadly departed Mark Cavendish. A lot of talk last night about how seldom it is that Cavendish gets really badly injured. You know, he, he's suffered, obviously, as a, as a sprinter, a lot of very heavy falls in his career, but has been remarkably resilient almost like a rubber ball he doesn't break bones but this was a bad one and I tweeted today a bit of fan footage from the side of the road of a a real close up of the crash and you just saw him land on his shoulder and skid along the road it's quite horrifying really um, to see it from that sort of angle and it's no surprise really that he was in in such a bad way and uh, you don't think he slept. Daniel, I think you spoke to him this morning, didn't you, in York? He came to the start. Um, yeah, he mainly wanted to talk about your book, Rich, and, and Lionel's and the cycling anthology. He that talked, Lionel did he? Did he yeah, really he didn't really want to it? talk about his injury. That's Etap, um, which oh, no. pub- <laughs> published a few weeks ago and available in all good bookshops. What did he say it's about it? Didn't tell me. Okay. Well, and, and the cycling anthology Let's published by Yellow Bird, Let's Jersey get, Press. And, yeah, okay. Yeah, to the script. Um, <laughs> that, that as if there was a script. Um... No, he was in fairly good spirits. I mean, his agent, um, Simon Bailiff, said that he was he was heartbroken, but um, he actually seemed in quite good spirits this morning. Um, you know, Rich, you talk about his his kind of resilience over the years, and, you know, he's had this fantastic sequence of Tours de France since 2008. And, you know, I think I was perhaps a bit unfair to him yesterday. I, I said that he has the tendency to take irresponsible risks um, when he's perhaps struggling slightly or um, his kind of desperation to win um, almost gets the better of him the, the race will certainly miss him there's no doubt about that I, the, I think there are certain members of Omega Pharma Quickstep who won't necessarily miss him I'm led to believe the mechanics are, are fairly sanguine. Are fairly sanguine about him leaving the race and I'm also led to believe that Jan Bacalans was very very miffed when he was told in some form of briefing um, before the Grand Depart um, last week that he was going to have to work for Cavendish. He was going to be an integral part of the, the lead-out train and he was so upset that he, was, he refused to speak to the Belgian journalist that day and he was grinning from ear to ear this morning. Yeah, sure can. So Jan Backlands is the Michael Rogers of the 2014 uh, Cavendish team, is he? Yeah, more or less. Well, you can kind of understand that. It might be quite hard for people... Um, who imagine that teammates are all for one goals. But Bacalance is a wild card type of rider. And if you're putting together a, um, a sprint train specifically for Mark Cavendish and then having uh, Mikko Kivatoski as your um, GC hope, Bacalance's role in that team is, is w- w- he, you know, he was shackled really until Cavendish um, had to go home. I mean, as we heard Lefebvre say, you know, they have to now re 
visit the tactics book and at least having Bacalance here you know as a team manager you would be happy that you've got a rider like Jan Bacalance here in the team because it gives you more options whereas guys like Mark Renshaw and Alessandro Pataki um, you know they haven't really got a role left in the team they're not going to be able to sprint and win in their own right um, they may well you know perhaps get try and get in breaks or what have you but um, Bacalance gives them a lot more options in the in the coming three weeks, and I think that's the one thing. Seeing Cavendish this morning um, walking away with his with his uh, tracksuit top arm swinging loosely against his side, it, it just struck me how long the tour is when you're you know when you lose one of the star riders on on the first day. I think it also highlights the need for a contingency plan, and you know we saw Richie Port today. You know, unfortunately, had a mechanical problem before home Moss, um, which was sort of one of the strategic key points of the race. Um, but again, I think today's stage... Um, did, he brought, did he not crash as well, Rich? Well, he had a blood coming out of his elbow. He certainly had some kind of problem before home moss. Uh, today just showed how fickle you know, the, the tour can be. And we've, we've asked questions before about Richie Port's kind of legitimacy as a second, as a sort of plan B, should anything happen to Chris Froome. You know, Greg LeMond made this point in our podcast before the Tour de France. You know, he would almost have had Bradley Wiggins there as a, as a substitute leader with no responsibility just to cover the bases because Sky invests so much money in cycling. He thought it was irresponsible to go in without a valid plan B. Now, in terms of Mark's injury, Daniel, I think you spoke to the Omega Pharma Quick Step doctor, didn't you? I did. I spoke to Helga Riepenhoff, who has worked, um, well, he's been a doctor at teams that. Um, with Mark Cavendish for, for several years. Um, he treated Mark after the finish last night. He took him for an x-ray and um, he had quite a job, I'm led to believe, convincing Mark that he, he couldn't start this morning. First of all, I asked him um, whether it was likely that Mark would need an operation for his shoulder injury. Yes, we will confirm it tonight. Um, first, we have to do an MRI scan to see which ligaments are really ruptured. I guess all of them are ruptured. Um, we can only do um, an indirect kind of examination so far with the ultrasound and the X-ray. Um, that was the equipment we got here. So, um, yeah, but it's very likely that uh, we need surgery. If that was the case, what would be the prognosis in terms of time off the bike out of competition? Yeah, it will be six weeks um, after the surgery. But during this time, we will. Um, check him to the BG hospital in Hamburg in Germany and start the rehabilitation so it's not that he's six weeks there without doing anything um, these days it's quite nice we can do lots of things especially there so he starts riding his bike in the water and then from there we build it up again so after six weeks he will not need too long um, to be back racing. Just talk us through what happened um, after the crash the kind of procedure that, that Mark went through you went through in terms of diagnosis and, and how he was um, in the evening yeah, it was a great setup they have now these days here at the tour. Um, it's, it's so much better than in the past. We um, went to the other uh, ambulance from the tour, um, brought us uh, to the truck um, in which they have an X ray and an uh, ultrasound machine. The way was a bit tricky because of the crowds, you can imagine, um, and Mark was in, in pain. But finally, we got there, and uh, it's really a brilliant team. There are radiologists there. Um, we did the imaging. We also looked at his hand and elbow. This is all fine, so no fractures there. Afterwards, it was just sitting down with Mark and uh, the SWAT directors and yeah, trying to explain him, convince him that uh, it's the right thing not to start because yeah, he's simply too injured for it. And there was some resistance. He obviously would have loved to have started and even this morning was, the, was that possibility kind of in, in his mind? Yeah, definitely a lot of resistance. Um, that was his major goal of the season, of many seasons probably. So um, he's very disappointed and he's really sad. He wanted to do everything. And yeah, we told him straight from the beginning, look, the truth is it will be impossible. But uh, he said he wanted to yeah, use any, any single, or any little chance. And uh, funny, there was none. But uh, that's Mark, always a fighter. And he wanted to race, that's for sure. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Supported by Jaguar. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. We are podcasting every day throughout the tour. You can subscribe on iTunes. We're also on Facebook. And we have a website, thecyclingpodcast.com. And we are blogging every day. I've blogged today on the sadly departed Mark Cavendish. I, I had a, a little bit of a moment, really, just reflecting on... Um, how much of a pain in the neck Cavendish can be when he's here but how much we'll actually miss him when he's not around because 
there's never a dull moment when he's around. And after Daniel. he allegedly said all those nice things about your book as well. No, no, I think my blog is affectionate. Your, okay. It's affectionate. I mean, no, I mean, he can be prickly, he can be, you know, you get the awkward silences and so on. Um, he, uh, he mumbles deliberately, That's, I'm, I'm convinced of that, but uh, I think... Um, on, you know, certainly we'll we'll miss Mark Cavendish this tour. We'll miss him when he's not around any longer because it is a privilege to report on a, a rider, an athlete who is probably the greatest sprinter of all time. I think, and and he's and one of the great characters. You know, a real one-off. Yeah, I mean the wider issue is, you know, he's stalled on twenty-five stage wins now until two thousand and fifteen, and you know. Um, the target is 34 to try and uh, equal and then overtake Eddie Merckx's um, all-time tour record, and he, he will be 30 when he arrives at the Tour de France next year. I think I think that you know Cavendish is not finished. He will he will win more stages. He's still the second fastest sprinter in the world, I would say, and it's not fair to compare him to Merckx. I mean, if he's looking at the, for the title of greatest sprinter in the world, he doesn't have to beat Merckx's record. Merckx was not a sprinter. Merckx was a was a phenomenon, a different a different type of rider altogether I think if Mark, Mark Cavendish retired tomorrow I think he would still go down in history as the, the best sprinter of all time and for five years he was he was unbeatable now he is beatable but he's still a formidable force and I think you know that, that over the next couple of years the, the victories will be perhaps fewer and, um, and, and, and further between but they'll be no less significant perhaps even more significant he often he often talks about how hard it is to just win one stage at the Tour. I mean, even when he was winning five or six stages, he always said, if I win one stage at this Tour, that's a success. It's very, very hard to win a stage of the Tour. He will not come back to the Tour and win multiple stages, I don't think, but those stages that he does win will be um, thoroughly deserved and, and great stories. You were wincing as I was speaking a minute ago when I mentioned uh, Cavendish's 25 stage wins and the potential... Um, that, well, that he's going to stall here on 25, still nine to equal the record. I know we're, he, it's not, it, it doesn't hang in the balance as to whether or not Mark Cavendish is the greatest sprinter of all time, um, but that record is is within reach. Certainly was within within reach. It, it stands to reason he's going to want to try and beat it, doesn't it? Yeah, and he's also, he will certainly. And he's also stalling. He's also stalled again on this challenge. This kind of. Um, final frontier of, of the yellow jersey which um, he hasn't taken yet Vincenzo Nibali completed his collection today of leaders jerseys in major tours will Cavendish get many more opportunities to take the yellow jersey well he won't it won't happen in Harrogate his mother's birth, birthplace again but um, Christian Prudhomme Prudy who we've just seen friend of the podcast waved, he's just been he waved, he waved at us um, he just walked past and um, we, we know that he does he's fond of a first stage four sprinters they might get the opportunity again will Kittle be there will Gripe will be there you know it's not going to be easy and you know you look at the things we've said this before on the podcast but there isn't an awful lot more of Cavendish um, for Cavendish to win he can, he can continue doing what he has been doing for a long time and, and rack up more and more victories but that is a I think that is a, a big goal and he really really wants to complete his collection it should be said that in the past when sprinters have worn the yellow jersey it's, it's usually been because of time bonuses which don't exist in the tour you know, if there's a prologue, then sprinters will claim the yellow jersey through time bonus. And remember, in the 90s, you know, Cipollini, Abdujaparov, Wilfred Nelson would all wear the yellow jersey at times. So it's a kind of arbitrary um, distinction in a way to make because the circumstances have conspired against Mark Cavendish there. Don't reopen that can of worms, Richard. I remember a very, very feisty, heated debate between Lionel and I a few months ago about time bonuses. Maybe we can get Prudy. I'm sure Prudy would be very glad to expound. His yeah. his it's argument as to why um, he abandoned time bonuses in 2008, I think, and he's never revisited that. We had a little chat with Thomas Carew, the um, ASO press officer, yesterday about that, and he said, "No, it is impossible. No time bonuses will be reintroduced." Let's. We should wrap up this podcast because we have to drive to London to our own beds tonight. We're all going to our own beds, aren't we, Daniel and Lionel? Individually, individually, <laughs> individually. Yeah, not 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 together. Um, but uh, Lionel, let's just mention briefly, uh, we had dinner last night in Leeds and we were invited by David Walsh, the chief sports writer of the Sunday Times. We walked into well, a cafe and I think it's fair to say quite a rundown part of Leeds, part of the jacket were outside, went in and it was a pretty basic cafe, nicely sort of decorated and so on with paintings and so on in the wall. And the, the party was a very distinguished gathering of Greg Lamond, his wife Cathy, 
There was Jonathan Vortis, Frankie Andrew, which meant there were two members of Lance Armstrong's 1999 Tour de France winning team, Asterisk. Uh, Nicole Cook was there, the former Olympic and world champion, and, and a few colleagues were there as well. And it was a very nice, uh, very nice occasion, wasn't it? Yeah, it certainly was, and um, the reason we were invited there by David Walsh was because his son, Connor, is involved in this The Junk Food Project, um, which is basically, it's a cafe that salvages food that is being thrown out by markets, supermarkets and restaurants, and is destined for landfill, and um, we ate this meal, and it was I thought it was a sort of touch of genius, really, because then the chef came out, who was a very passionate, intense, energetic um, young guy who, to explain the concept of this cafe which is staffed entirely by volunteers um, they go off basically rescuing food that is being thrown out often because it's just past the arbitrary supermarket sell by dates um, and he explained all about that and it was a really um, it was a really uh, quite a moving inspiring speech that he gave and, and, am- and amongst that company you know to sort of hear Greg Lamond um, you know, muttering his, uh, his, his sort of appreciation as, as this young guy, uh, his name Adam Smith, um, was talking about his project. And they were talking about how they, they fee- feed not only sort of homeless people, but also people who are basically um, in food poverty where they can't afford to buy food. And uh, it just really struck me as, a, as an incredibly noble and worthy thing to be doing. And, um, and as I kind of blog my way around France on my own website, lionelburney.com, slash gourmet um, le gourmet de france is my uh, photographic blog of uh, every meal i every evening meal i have on the tour not it, everything you eat that would be the internet's not big <laughs> enough for that <laughs> yes thanks richard but yeah I, I wrote a blog about that and um if you are interested in that kind of thing do have a look at that because one of the things we kind of grumble about on the tour is how hard it is to um, get up in the morning and watch and write and talk about bike racing and then you know, run the risk of missing dinner. And actually, um, last night's meal really put all of that into quite a sort of sharp perspective. <laughs> it was a humbling experience and a delicious meal. And uh, also, we, we should say it's, it was a, an honesty box. It was pay what you felt it was worth. So I stuck in a fiver. Scott <laughs> didn't really, didn't really. We all, um, I think, pay generously. You can find them on at Real Junk Food on Twitter. At Real Junk Food, thoroughly recommended. After Chiro's grousing yesterday about the pasta on the Tour de France, perhaps he should have, he should have gone along as well. He would have gained from that. Let's wrap it up there, Lionel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, wrap it up, Rich. Wrap it up. Have a have a great night, guys, and uh, see you in London. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar.